Thank you, Charles. That was uh, Thank you. such a wide-ranging, uh, amazing uh, lecture. I definitely feel instructed afterwards. <laughs> um, there's so much to talk about. I guess I wanted to think about, and something we're exploring in our programming here and at Hai uh, Jamil in Jeddah, is how politics shapes the palate um, and how social structures also affect uh, how we taste things, what we eat, etc. Um, and, uh, you know, I wanted to come back to this idea of how we trace wider historical shifts through, um, through food products as well. So everybody knows how sugar is one of the main sort of ways that you can look at the influence um, of plantation slavery and how that completely changed the palate in sort of uh, the Britain, for example, in Western Europe, and mm, also how that structured sort of class relations as well. So is there any sort of component you think in, in this historical trajectory you gave us that provides that lens to also look at how technologies kind of shaped uh, different parts of... Yes. So usually the, the main element when we talk about uh, agriculture and food culture is that we never bring in the local story, the what we call history from below. You know, there is usually history, is the, history, the boring history of state formation, the boring history from above, the history of the ruling elites. And this has been the dominant force in historiography. So everything that is related to day-to-day -day life, to technology, to recipes, to food is out of the story. However, now there is a new uh, school of studies that was pioneered in, in India, actually, uh, uh, subaltern studies, and uh, uh, where you actually reconstruct the bigger story from the small, from the village, from the neighborhoods, from the house, from the techniques, from you take sugar, for example, because you mentioned, and you reconstruct how sugar was transformed into a global trading item uh, in the Abbasid period. And, and you sh uh, weave around it all the elements and you feed into it science, technology, and you remove an element that was key in the way we conceived ourselves and the way we wrote history, colonialism. Mm -hmm. Colonialism that basically told us, well, you are barbarians and you uh, are not producers of civilization. However, now we are changing and we are rediscovering. So we can rediscover this beautiful history th through small elements such as sugar. Yeah, and I suppose, you know, the conception of history is linear and progress is linear and that everything gets better with time. Of course, <laughs> as we know, this is a fallacy. But it's interesting to think about why certain historical documents are given importance in certain uh, periods of time and why they kind of surface also in the popular imaginary, why, peop why people get excited about them. And I think, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I feel like there is a movement to look back at historical cooking, yes. historical food, historical, you know, obviously um, traditional ways of planting, and that has to do with food resilience and climate change and how we can go back and learn about indigenous plants and, and, and indigenous agricultural techniques. So in terms of also this idea of coming back to certain ways of cooking and taste, do you think, why do you think that's also something that's resurfacing uh, currently? This is a very interesting uh, uh, um, access to, to, to develop. It's, it's not uh, a going back. Because, as you said, this is not a linear uh, historical development. It is a discovery. Because going back to uh, the cuisine that existed in Baghdad in the 9th century is impossible. Because not only we don't have the uh, 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 products, but we don't have the anthropological context that uh, made these foods possible. However, if we go back and study and place these recipes, into their social, economic, political context, we can build better understanding of, the, of this period and, and try to understand how uh, uh, complex history in this region, as everywhere, is and not as a simple idea of progress, Eurocentric progress that has to take into consideration all the periods of history, such as the Europeans, coin them. So we have a different story. And, and food is one of the doors, one of the gates that would allow us to go back to a better understanding of, 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 of our history and our region, 
especially in our current context where our food sovereignty is challenged, where we, are where we are facing what seems to be the beginnings of a massive climatic change in, in the Middle East. In, in Lebanon, we are witnessing uh, the beginnings of what we call a little ice age. And, uh, and, and this is something that is uh, 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 rather challenging to be able to uh, uh, sustain uh, uh, the, the population. So food, for me, is a key. And rediscovering these uh, texts, the texts were always there. So problem is, as one of my teachers once told me, that there is a story about uh, uh, the great Kamal Salibi, when he um, discovered uh, a, a new historical document, he was so happy that he went and told a friend that I rescued this document from obscurity. His friend told him, well, you rescued the document from one obscurity to another. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the, the idea is that is how we use the material, how we use yeah. the material. I don't want to say that there is a conspiracy because conspiracy theories are rather nonsense. <laughs> Let's say it like that. But they were out of the scope because there was not local scholarship on this uh, uh, topic. Like Nawal Nasrallah is an Iraqi scholar. She is one of the major references on Arabic cooking. She is one of the first Arabs to actually introduce food studies, culinary heritage studies, into the global, uh, into global academia. So it has started, and we still are living in the first, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, effects mm. of this rediscovery. I guess what strikes me about these books in particular, I only had a, a quick browse, because I think we have it in our library, but um, yes. It's from the library, it's actually. From the library. <laughs> um, is that a lot of the recipes obviously come from the cookbooks of palaces and sort of uh, yes. people of you know higher uh, in higher mm. classes? But yet the recipes that survived are the simpler ones, the bawarid and the falafel and the hummus. And maybe it's a, it's a you know simple question, but why is it that these recipes were forgotten? It's a very please. No, please. It's, it's very <laughs> important. However, there's a, 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 an element that we need to keep in mind. Even these recipes that were uh, very uh, en vogue in the palaces were recreated on the streets. So uh, it, it, this is, um, let's say, even if what I'm going to say is profoundly anachronistic, this was a democratic <laughs> culture of food. So this is why you have these... Um, uh, uh, food, uh, plates that carry the names of the rulers, but they were eaten by mm. the uh, uh, commoners. However, the elements is that you upgrade the uh, 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 products you use in your recipe. This has survived in the Middle East. So whenever you are invited to a feast, you would find a lot of grilled nuts on the plate. Why? Because this is something that is rather expensive. You can do the uh, rice with chicken. This is a rather simple recipe. But when you upgrade it and you add, so these, uh, uh, there is a social mobility in mm -hmm. these recipes. They are developed in the palace, and they go down to the street. And we also have evidence of rather simple street food that goes all the way to the palace. I was talking with uh, uh, one of the participants about what we call luqaymat, luqmat al-qadi. They are some form of primitive donuts in the Middle East. These were street food that found their way to the palace. So it's also it gives this very important social dimension to why it is relevant to study this culinary heritage. Mm -hmm. However, the, the, the hummus and the falafel, well, hummus and the current recipes of hummus and falafel are recent. Uh, falafel is probably of Indian origin, and it appeared in Egypt in the late 19th century, and then became one of the very popular street food. Hummus is documented here, but uh, 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 in recipes that are similar to what we now have, but they are more sophisticated. So you have uh, vinegar added, and you have walnuts, and you have the simple recipes uh, 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 well this is the
palace food that was transformed into fast food. Mm. Right. I'm going to open to a few questions, um, just mindful of time, and I'm sure people have so many questions for you, and then we can keep conversing as well. Hello. I am. First of all, shukran kteer. Thank you so Ahlan. much. This was by far like the most interesting lecture I have been um, listening to for a while. Shahid ni irja jama and like I want to go back and study this. This is, and great. <laughs> this is amazing. So thank you, thank you so much for Ahlan. this. Um, uh, first and and also thank you for um, sort of talking about how Iraq uh, and Iraqi cookbooks, because um, we often have this feud between me and my husband, he's Lebanese, I'm Iraqi, and who discovered what, so <laughs> this is... <laughs> um, but I do, have a, I do have an interesting question. I've always been interested in uh, the anthropology of food in Iraq, yes. but, but when you were talking, uh, something crossed my mind, you know, when we studied uh, the Abbasid and Abbasi al-Nahda and everything that happened then, we really did focus a lot on how they invested so much money into the making of knowledge and poetry and science. And, and we, in our curriculums, uh, we're not shy in mentioning how that was truly the golden age True. of Islam. But there was a complete alienation of anything that to do with agriculture. And I understand that there is some sort of like, what you've explained quite well, like this, this information was not really discovered, but I can't help but wonder to that extent. I mean, I know details of the money that was given to Abu Nawas, Ughera, to produce poetry, yes. but I don't know about, for example, frike, a superfood. Like, it's just, how is it that we've studied so much about the Abbasiyin and we never really came across this? It's a beautiful question. And to, to answer it, we need to go back to why did we write these histories? So, of course, we've known uh, uh, that uh, uh, there was a golden age, there, was, there were funds that were given into the production of knowledge, but how did that, uh, 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 how that was reflected in, in history books, in schools? You know that the um, nation states, uh, the Middle East is an extremely old region. However, the nation states are young. They are less than a century old. And in the process of state building, you need it because the model that was used uh, uh, was nationalism, European nationalism. So you had the nation state. And history teaching in a nation state model is key. Because this is, this is considered to be one of the pillars of uh, 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 creating this identity. And feel good periods and periods of glory and periods that would give you a sense of national pride were highlighted. So this is why you have this emphasis on Baghdad as a center of learning. Of course it was, but there was also other forms of learning related to agriculture. Why it didn't make its way? Well, I can propose two theories. First, well, talking about chickpeas is not that glorious. <laughs> And two, and this might be the uh, proper, but we didn't know about these uh, 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 books and documentation. We had some uh, elements, but it didn't really come to the surface before the 70s and 80s. And so why, this is why was it the 70s and 80s particularly? Uh, well, this is a period when you have a massive uh, influx of manuscripts, and you have uh, a big investment done by states in the Middle East of opening their, uh, creating national archives and opening their archives. You had massive libraries in the 70s uh, uh, in Baghdad and Damascus and Aleppo, and scholars, and Al Qahira, Cairo, and scholars were in, invited to come and study. And so this is why we study, oh, we have Kitab al Tabiq. <laughs> we have. Question. Thank you, thank you very much. I will try to answer your question by telling you what's happening in Spain with our recognition to our agricultural and Islamic past. So what's happening is uh, there is a double marginalization because it's not only about rejecting certain ideas of identity but also about not recognizing the rural heritage. Anything that is produced by the farming communities, by the Falahin, is not being considered culture. So for instance, if you look at uh, the Spanish criteria of uh, heritage, the public money that has been put in Alhambra, 
you know how to protect it because it's a building because it belongs to the royal and stuff you know the uh, cordoba uh, the mosque and everything uh, it's not that money is flooded but there is money for that if you look at Valencia, you know the city of Valencia that it has one of the oldest system of irrigation put in place by the farming communities that migrated from this part of the world in the 8th and 9th century, which is amazing, and it's still in place, is under danger. Now they're trying to protect it by uh, going to the UNESCO to claim that the, the way that not only the, the water canals and how it's managed, but the social element of it. There is a tribunal, that is El Tribunal de las Aguas, then they manage the agreement is the fastest tribunal in Europe. It sorts the, the problems in seven days. They don't have papers. They do everything on the spot. And this is inherited by the time where we're a Muslim country. Where the meetings of this tribunal happens outside the Cathedral of Valencia, Valencia uh, which used to be the old mosque. So there are so many different elements. So there's a double marginalization in the sense like within the colonial powers, there are many different structures, but there is an internal war between urban and rural. So there's, our stories are never accounted. The things that happen to the Falahin, you know, worldwide are never been taken into. So uh, maybe that's one of the Of course, of, the reasons. of course. And not only the Falahin, but also the Bedouins are out of the scope. You only talk about history yeah. of the cities and of the elites in the cities, not even the poor in the cities. To, but however, to build this better understanding, we have to put the three together. The city, the Falah, and the Bedouin. Any other questions, uh, Nadia? We have five minutes, so I guess that's two more questions. Uh, wait, just if you could give us a little bit of a sense of the social and political economic um, structures in which this agricultural revolution is happening. Like who owned the land? What was labor like? What were the institu knowledge institutions like around this farming revolution? This is, this is a very important question because this is where we need to talk about what we call the dark side of history. So, of course, this, uh, the, the, the rural communities were key in this. Uh, you had some form of private mulk, but the main big productive uh, estates were owned by the elites. We also have here uh, an element that is out of the scope in Middle Eastern history, slavery. In southern Iraq, we have, the, uh, we have a rather nasty word by our standards, but back then it was common, zinj, uh, uh, which was used to describe um, slaves from sub-Saharan Africa. We have a revolution of the zinj, a very important event in Abbasid story because of uh, their work conditions. So uh, the question of who owned the land, we have this uh, 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 clear idea that this, these productive big estates were owned by the elites. We have the question of slavery and production of knowledge. Well, you have either state-funded institutions such as Dar al-Hikmah in Baghdad that was replicated in other cities, or the madrasas, the, because madrasas weren't only uh, religious schools, these were what we could uh, 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 understand as some form of universities. So let's say that this wasn't a uh, centralized uh, uh, knowledge production. It was, it had multiple centers. And because even if you had a political unity for a short period of time, you had the fragmentation of the Abbasid empire into uh, 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 states. However, with the preservation of a certain cultural unity while using Arabic. We have uh, time for one more question. OK. Because you were talking. Hello. Oh, because you were talking about um, the knowledge production and how things are not al available, and you mentioned the subaltern studies, etc. And it made me think uh, in a book that was published in the 30s, end of the 30s in Brazil, by uh, Gilberto Freire, a sociologist, and it's called Sugar. And I think this is one of the first books produced in a non-central country 
that is talking about, I mean, doing sociology from the kitchen. It's yes. not recipes from palace, it's recipes from the kitchen in the houses and doing a reading of that. So I think in something of what you have said, for me, coming from Latin America, um, there is a lot of commun commonalities in terms of how to rediscover these this recipes and how to relate to, to completely different kind of, 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 of landscapes, let's say. Uh, we, do, we do have greens, but not only always are in our flags, uh, I have to say, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but I think that perhaps uh, a, a better communication within peripheral global south. global south could help us to rediscover commonalities that yes. are not so so bad. Thank you, Thank for you that. very much for, Thank you for, for your that. talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Just you. on that note of, um, you know, we have a, an amazing display in the hallway here by Salma Seri. Oh, with, you know, researching into, into the food menu also as a site of social research. So if you have time afterwards, please do have a look. But thank you so much, Charles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. That's great.